A little word about that song. We uh, went to Romania, what was it, two years ago, I guess. And, uh, oh, youth group. Youth group, go that way. I'm not used to that, right? So look at all those youth. Check that out. Turn around. You have permission to turn around. Yeah, right on. Um, you know, as we were driving around all through Bradshaw, Romania, we were listening to that For King and Country song that we just sung. And it sort of became the theme song. Like, wherever we go, you know, that's the thing. They're going to know that we're Christians by our love, right? And I love the fact that Jesus pretty makes it, makes it simple. I'm a simple guy. Uh, I tend to forget things fairly easily, like that just now. Uh, so, so the fact that the Lord says, look, there's two things you really need to know. You do this, you're going to be okay, right? What is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. That's great because the commandments of the law were 613 commandments. How many of you want to try to keep all those? <laughs> they will know we are Christians by our love. And, and, I, and I pray that that becomes, you know, not just a nice little cool song we sing, but the reality of our lives. And it happens the more that we are in touch with God who is love, right? It's about abiding in his presence. He's here. His love is here. And, you know, would that we would come with like empty cups and say, Lord, pour it on us. Pour it on us. Amen? Because I, I don't have the capability of manufacturing that love any more than you do. You try to do it. Oh, I'm trying to love. You know, that's like, that's crazy. No, you, you, you get in touch with the one who is love and you let his love live in and through you. Amen? That's what it's all about. Well, last week, we're in Matthew chapter 19. We're going to end that out and go into chapter 20. Last week, we saw that there was this guy who really, in the eyes of the world, had it made in the shade, okay? He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. Everything you could want. But there was something vitally missing from his life. And so he came to Jesus because he perceived, perceived that Jesus had the answer he was looking for. And so he said, Jesus, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, and he gave him you know, some of the commandments there from the Ten Commandments. And he said, well, I've kept these. And he said, and, and by the way, also love your neighbors yourself. He said, well, I've, keep, I've kept all these since I was a, a youth. What am I lacking? And Jesus said, okay, do this. If you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have. Give it all, the money to the poor. You'll have great reward in heaven. And then come and follow me. Be my disciple. Free yourself up. Come follow me. You see? And he turned away and he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, I tell you the truth. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the, the disciples were astounded. What? What are you saying? Well, well who, who then can even be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So that's where we left it last week. And then, you know, Peter, Peter is thinking. Peter is thinking about what Jesus had said to this rich young ruler. And, and so he said, uh, verse 27, he said, see, we have left all. Therefore, what shall we have? <laughs> you laugh. This is Peter, man. Peter's raw. You, got, you, know, you know what you got with Peter. There's not a lot of filter between what he thinks and what he says, okay? What shall we have? We've left everything. And they had. I mean, they left 
the boat, the fish, the career, the wife in Peter's case, to tramp around the countryside with this Jesus of Nazareth, you know. What, what's going to happen to us? He's thinking about what Jesus said. You know, leave everything, sell it, give it to the poor, you'll have great reward in heaven. And he's saying, well, what's in this for us now then, you see? And I love the answer Jesus gives. He said to, to them, directs it to all of them, because he knows Peter's just speaking the same thing, right, that everybody else is thinking. They're just not saying it. So, so he says, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The regeneration. Folks, if you don't like the world today, take heart. <laughs> There's a new world coming. There's a new kingdom coming. The Lord does not want you to get too comfortable here. Do you understand? Because we have a better world coming. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. Where in dwells righteousness. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can you imagine? So there's this regeneration coming, this uh, the kingdom. Jesus is going to return. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to reign. It's going to be a thousand year reign. And at some point, probably then, these 12 apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what's going to happen because... You were willing to leave everything to follow me. So Jesus commends them, really. Tells them this is what's going to happen. And by the way, it's sort of interesting. There is the question, you know, was that apostolic office just for the early church or are there apostles today? There are those that teach there are apostles today. I believe that this really proves that can't be the case. The 12 apostles of the early church were unique. They're the ones that are having these 12 thrones. It's not like they're going to keep adding more thrones, you see. They were unique. And one of the qualifications, as Paul would state, is that they had to have seen the resurrected Lord. So who are the 12? You know, well, we know Judas is not one of them. Uh, but to me, in my mind, it's questionable. Is it Matthias? You know, where they cast lots to choose the 12th one to fulfill Judas's role? Or is it the Apostle Paul? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, there are 12 apostles, 12 thrones, and they were going to get a, an amazing reward. And then Jesus broadens the scope here. Verse 29. He says, And everyone who left, has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. You know, we see the model of this with Abram who lived in the in a land of idolatry, in the land of Ur of the Chaldees, and God spoke to him and said, look, Abram, leave your land, leave your father, leave your family, go to a place that I will show you, and I will bless you. And through you, through your seed, all of the nations of the world shall be blessed. And Abram believed God, he went, he left. He went to the land of Canaan, he lived as a sojourner, a nomad, a stranger in the land. Didn't own anything except the burial ground for his wife, Sarah. And that ultimately he was buried there as well. But he believed God and he went, you see. And there's something about that God blesses faith. And faith often requires Sacrifice. 
You leave something in order to gain something much better, you see. You have to let go of that which is temporal to gain that which is eternal. See? And so, there's an exchange. Now, it was really cool. Uh, Saturday before last, a bunch of our guys, you know, we have this, this moving team. I love these guys, man. They just show up and, whoo, uh, you know, they move. Now, the thing is, if you ever call them, that's great. Uh, just make sure that you're packed when they get there, okay? Right FYI. <laughs> but they will move you in a hurry, okay? So anyway, I was, I was with them two weeks ago. They were moving um, Chris and Sarah that moved here, Arisa, came here from California and um, just got this new place and they're so excited. And, but it was just so much fun to watch and uh, even to interact. I get to talk to Sarah a little bit about where God has brought them from. Now what had happened was Chris... Uh, had gotten to know Justin, our, our son, at, at Bible college. And Justin asked him to be in, in J- Justin and Lacey's wedding. Uh, and so he came up. Well, he, when he came up, he fell in love with, with, you know, Idaho. And it was in his mind, I've got to get to Idaho. Someday I'm going to Idaho, you know. And so uh, I'll not forget when he came up. He came up to just scout it out. He left his wife and kids with his, you know, dad and and mom and and came here and lived here for a while on his own, got a job. I mean, this is how intense he was living with Jason and Dana for a while. This is how intense he was to, to come up here, you know. And then, you know, then he was able to ultimately get his family up here. Now, understand... After his family moved up here, they were living, they'd been living in a two-bedroom apartment, four kids. But they wanted to be in Idaho, amen? (laughs) But you know how it is when, if you're a grandparent, because once those grandkids get moved out of state, that's a a magnet that is like no other. Like no other's mother, okay, right? And so now, Joe and Lisa have come up here, and they've moved up here. Uh, Chris's dad and mom. So anyway, so I was just thinking, I was telling Sarah, it's been so cool to see how you have taken these steps of faith and how the Lord has blessed that. Amen? <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I, and I was thinking about that as I was looking at this scripture. And some of you, I know I, I wasn't there for the uh, new to the church thing. I was sick that day. Um, but my wife uh, recorded it, okay? So, and it's now on uh, Facebook, YouTube, all social media. No, I'm just kidding. It's just for me. Um, but it was so cool. We had like 14 new people coming to our church. Many of them from out of state. One person said, yes, I'm from the occupied, occupied state of Oregon. And uh, we moved to Idaho, a bunch from California. And it was just like, I know what that's like. We know what that's like because that's what we did, you know, 20, gosh, 27 years ago. And we left family and job and land and all, you know, house and all that to come here. And it wasn't easy at first. Let me just tell you, it wasn't easy. But then I look and I say, God, how you've blessed. You've been so faithful. You've been so good. You've been so gracious. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, look, you leave stuff to follow me for my name's sake. And you're going to get a hundredfold in this life. And, And you leave some relationships. Yeah, some people may not understand, but you gain so many more new relationships. And even though you may not gain stuff materially, you know, it, the hundredfold may not be in quantity. It may be in quality, okay? But you cannot outgive God. And, and I think this is what Jesus was saying. It's just like, you, I see it, and I will bless if you trust me. So, 
Um, but, verse 30, he said, many who are first will be last and the last first. What does that mean? Why did Jesus say that? Well, perhaps it was to help the disciples not to strive to be first. Because this is what they were doing continuously all the way up until the Last Supper. They're still arguing about who's greatest, who's going to have the position in the kingdom, who's going to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus, you know, all of this stuff. And it's just like, look, you know, yes, there are blessings, but understand that many who are first now will be last later. And many who are last now will be first later. It's not about the position. It's about obedience. See? It's about just being obedient to the Lord, to where he's called you to be. That's what you should seek. You know, the greatest, I'll never forget this one conversation I had with this guy. And he had been in and out of our church. He struggled with alcohol. He struggled with a lot of drugs. He struggled with a lot of stuff. He ended up in prison. And I went to visit him there and... um, And I said, how are you doing? And he said, you know what? I'm doing great. And I said, how's that? He said, because I finally realized that success is when my will and the Lord's align. (laughs) That's success. That is success. When your will is in alignment with God's, there's no greater success than that. Doesn't matter if you're in Idaho State Penn, you know? <laughs> you're, you're living the dream <laughs> because you're in the will of God. Remember, Paul said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't complaining about that. He realized that the Lord put him there. And he was okay with that. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying you don't try to get out and get better and all that, but Understand, if you know you're where God wants you to be, that's success. So, man, maybe Jesus also said this to help us all not be so focused on this life and the things we have or we don't have because we're all prone to covetousness, greed, and envy. We all deal with these things, you know? I mean, we, we know what it says in Romans, you know. Weep with those who weep. We get it. That's okay. We can, I, I mean, that's good. But the rejoice with those who rejoice? How come that guy gets all that stuff? How, how come he has all the people going to his church? Here, I'm slaving, sweating it out. What? What's in it for me, God? You know? And we don't vocalize that because that's not the Christian thing to do. (laughs) But we're thinking it. So Jesus, you know, Jesus, he knows these guys. He knows where they're going. Look, don't get get caught up in, in who's got what and what position and title. And by the way, let me just say, title is severely overrated. Who the heck cares about a title? People strive for that. They, 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 you know, they do anything to get it, but then you get it and it's like, so what? And by the way, history never remembers people for their title. It remembers them for what they did. Right? So focus on what you do. And, you know, if God gives you some title, great. If he lifts you up, promotion comes not from the east or from the west, but from God. The Lord lifts one up and puts down another. So just, you know, and I think that that's the thing is that he's saying, look, just understand that this whole first and last business, it doesn't matter. What matters is just serving the Lord, serving others in love, being content with what God has given you. No man, as John the Baptist said, you know, when his disciples came to him, hey, John, you know that guy that you baptized over in the Jordan? Well, 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 all the people are going to him now. What's with that? You know? 
And John said, hey, look, a man can only receive what's given him from heaven. He must increase, I must decrease. He's the bridegroom. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. I'm just the, the friend of the bridegroom. You know, it's okay. I'm good. I've done my job. I've prepared the bride for the bridegroom. Chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day? But he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Obviously, he didn't live in a socialistic government. Anyway, it's another story, sorry. Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called but few chosen. Interesting. Now, Jesus is illustrating this principle. The first should be last, the last should be first. And the parable is to illustrate that. Now clearly, the landowner here is the Lord. The laborers are believers who have responded to his call to serve him. And some have a long time that they serve him. Many, many years. Faithfully serving God, you know. Others, a very, very short time. Think about the, the thief on the cross. How long did he have to serve the Lord in this life? A few seconds. <laughs> Maybe a few minutes. And so, different times. They all receive salvation, but their wage varies. Because the laborers hired at the beginning of the day receive one-twelfth of the hourly wage. Even though they're all getting the same amount, it's, it's one-twelfth of the hourly wage as the ones that are hired at 5 p.m., you see. And they had a problem with that. So what do we learn about this? Okay. First off, let's take a look at the landowner. I'm going to look at the landowner. We're going to look at the laborers. And then we're going to try to make some application here. First off, the landowner. What do we know about him? Well, he employs laborers for his vineyard. It's his vineyard. He decides who's going to work it. And so early in the morning, he makes an agreement with the day laborers for the standard wage of a denarius. Now, I, when, I, when we first moved here, okay, there was a time I was at this place called Labor Ready. You had to be there at 5 a.m. 
And it was like, I mean, I was, I was hungry for work, you know. I was, I'm there, you know, come on, please hire me. I'll do anything, you know. They didn't hire me. And that's another story <laughs> I'll go into it sometime with you. But I understand sort of this, this thing. You know, they go to the, to the labor place. You hire them day labor for the day. He hires people because he, he needs workers for his vineyard. And they agree. Now, was it the laborers that said, okay, how much are you going to pay us? We don't really know. Or was it the landowner that said, okay, you know, this is what I'll pay you. We don't know. But there was an agreement made. It was, it, was a, it was a day contract kind of a thing. You work for me, I'll pay you a denarius, which was the standard day's wage. And they agreed to that, okay? Then he finds others later in the day and tells them to go and work in his vineyard, and he will pay them whatever is right. And guess what? They go. Okay, hey, sounds good. We'll do it. But he doesn't tell them what he's going to pay them. He just says, I'll just pay you what's right. And they go. Now, obviously, this landowner hates to see anybody standing around doing nothing. Because he keeps hiring more people throughout the day. You know? Hey, listen, the work is too great. The laborers are too few. Nobody can afford to sit around and do nothing. Understand? The work is great. And we understand there's how many billions of people in the world. How many of them have their names written in the book of life? How many of them know Jesus personally? How many of them are going to hell? Jesus said, broad is the way leading to destruction. How many of them are going to eternal life to heaven? And the only way, God, the Lord called us, you and me, to be that light, to share the gospel, to go into all the world and make disciples. And if we sit on our duff, it doesn't happen. Now, this isn't about your salvation. It's about their salvation, see? It, it, the work is too great for people to be sitting around. So the landowner is hiring whomever he can, whomever is willing. Now this is really interesting. He makes the laborers hired at 6 a.m. stick around to see how generous he is to the ones at 5 p.m. that he hired. <laughs> now this is not the way it would normally be done. Typically, people's salaries are private, right? And, you know, the political, politically correct kind of thing to do would be you pay those guys first that were hired first, get them out of here, and then, you know, I'll show the other ones I'm going to be just as kind to them. He purposefully wanted these guys who were hired in the beginning to know how generous he was with these who simply just said, I will go and I trust you to pay me what's right. Understand? That's why he gives instructions to the servant, see to it that you pay the last ones hired first and then pay the first ones hired last. Understand? And so he is generous to the ones who simply trust him to give what is right. This was not a contractual agreement. This was, do you trust me? Yes, I trust you. I'll pay you what's right. I trust you. All right, go. He's generous to them. Do you see grace in this? See? They got what they didn't deserve. Then he points out that the laborers hired first have a wrong attitude and an evil eye. Why? Because he is generous to others. They got what, he was honest, he was faithful, he paid them what he said he would. He was true to the contract. But they were angry with him. They complained against him. Why? Because he was generous to others. And he says, that's not right. It's my stuff. I can be generous with it if I want. 
Now, what do we know about the laborers? All the laborers were willing to work for the landowner. We know that. The laborers hired at 6 a.m. make an agreement, as I said, to work for a denarius. Now, wouldn't this apply to the Jews who originally served God under the law, under the covenant, the agreement that specified you do this and, and God will do this, you know? They had a contractual covenant agreement. And they were hired early. They were the ones that first responded to the call of God to follow him. Now the laborers hired, laborers that were hired later throughout the day and then all the way up to 5 p.m. Trust the landowner to pay them what is right. And doesn't that apply to the Gentiles? Right? God is calling out the bride of Christ. Not under the law, but under grace. Saying, hey, do you trust me? Will you follow me? Yes, yes. All right. Now the laborers that were hired first saw that what the others were paid, when they, when they got to see that those people hired at five and three and, you know, they, at first they think, they only worked an hour, they're getting a denarius. At first they're thinking, oh, that means I'm going to get 12 denarii. Hey! And then he finds out the ones that are hired at three, they're getting a denarius. Hey, that's weird. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, and, and all the way down. And until, you know, yeah, you're getting a denarius, just like them. What? They suppose they would receive more. Oh, expectations. Hmm. They complained against the landowner, didn't think he was being fair because he made those who were hired at the end of the day, they didn't have to bear the heat of the day. They didn't have to suffer the way we suffered. That's not fair. Anybody that's ever had siblings knows what that is all about. Amen? It's not fair. Their piece of cake is bigger than mine. You know the solution to that? I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you have one of them cut the cake and you have the other make the first choice. Oh my gosh, they'll get out there with a micrometer and make sure absolutely even. Put it on them. Little, little, I, that's extra. I mean, it's not extra. You got a freebie. I just threw that in. <clears throat> so, now what is the main purpose of the parable? I, number one, I do not believe this parable is about salvation. Because everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is saved. We each receive righteousness and justification by grace through faith. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were given the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's justification by faith. Credited to your account by grace through faith. Amen? You can't improve upon that. You know, just trying to polish your halo every day. Oh, you can get that halo a little bit shinier. Because your righteousness isn't about you. It's the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. So the, you know, the apostle Paul, Peter, John, John who was at the cross, the only one who was at the cross, and the thief that was on the cross, the moment the thief, thief received Jesus Christ, believed in him, he had the same righteousness and the same right standing before God as John the Apostle, the one whom Christ loved, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Same. That's the power of justification by faith. Understand that. This is not about salvation. Because we all receive the same salvation. We all receive the same righteousness of Jesus. We have to have the righteousness of Jesus or we can't enter heaven. And those who are seeking their own righteousness or think that they're better than somebody else because they've done everything right, they're going to hell. 
if they do not believe in Jesus Christ. That's the tragedy. A lot of good people are going to hell because they're leaning on their self-righteousness and not the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that lie that Satan has sold to this world, we have to counter because that's not the truth. But the good news is, is that, hey, we know I'm, just, I'm justified. Not because I was a good person this week. I mean, I strive to be like Jesus. I strive to be holy as the Lord is holy. We're supposed to do that. But my righteous standing with God is not based on that. It's based on what Jesus Christ did for me. Amen? So I don't think it's about that. So, secondly, I don't believe that it's about our rewards in heaven. For we will each be rewarded according to what we have done. The Bible is very clear about that. Jesus said, Matthew 10, 42, Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. You give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus to somebody, you do anything, you fill their tank up with gas, you give them some food, you take them out to McDonald's and buy them a burger, whatever you do. It's not big things. God is keeping the score. You will receive a reward for that. God is faithful. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Reward, okay? Salvation is by faith. Rewards are by works, right? By what we've done. Determines rewards that God will give. 1 Corinthians 3.8 says each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So, I do believe that the parable, it's not, it's not about salvation, it's not about eternal rewards. It is emphasizing the right attitude we must have in serving. That's the point of this. It's to show us the attitude that we should have toward God, toward one another. Number one, God is free to distribute gifts, callings, opportunities as he sees fit. He gives answer to nobody. He's God. Right? Just because we have been serving him a long time doesn't mean he can't choose somebody new to do the job. That's his prerogative. You know, two weeks ago when I was sick, I I went to the men's koinonia. I was feeling great. I got home, I started feeling lousy. So I called Jeff. Jeff, you know that message you gave to the men? How about giving that to the church tomorrow? (laughs) Now here's what I think was happening. I think God wanted that message for the church. So he just said, cold, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's okay. I'm happy. I, 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 I'm, almost, I'm happy when God uses other people. Frankly, I had a Sunday off. I got to sit at home. Sit at home. See it at home like you guys. Um. <laughs> So it's God's prerogative to choose whom he will choose. Uh, Now, we must beware of the attitude of entitlement. That's just so entrenched in our society. We must not suppose we will receive something like these guys did because of seniority, position, privilege, title, I will never forget, my pastor used to stress this point. I never understood it when he first said it, because I was a young believer, but now I get it. He said, 